All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Catching Colorado podcast. I am thrilled for this episode. It has been a long time coming, Austin. <laughs> yes, it certainly has. Yeah. Um, we are today at Discount Fishing Tackle down in Denver. This is Austin's shop, and uh, we're filming our podcast. Finally made it down here. We've been planning to do this for a while. And, uh, dude, I'm stoked to be here. Thanks for making this happen absolutely. for us. Absolutely. Thanks so much for coming down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we just wanted to uh, bring Austin on. For those of you that don't know who Austin Parr is, um, he is a guide. He is a local fisherman. He has worked at this tackle shop since he was a young kid. Yep. And uh, he's just, if you don't know Austin in the Denver area, he is the way to go for lures walleye advice you name it this guy's got uh the brain for fishing so we figured it'd be a great time to uh talk with you sit down go through uh you know what you've been up to and, and yeah. ask you some questions and let people uh, get to know you a bit it's that time of year we're in the spring now and and guys are getting ready to get out that's right yeah absolutely well speaking of uh the spring now the bite has been rough this year it really has i mean definitely some some different kind of weather patterns at the moment uh ice came off earlier than normal and all of us were kind of excited to to get out and maybe have a couple extra weeks of open water in the early season but it seems like the fish aren't necessarily in line with where they would be on the ice out that you would think but more in line with where they might be as far as time of year wise uh, as far as physical date right um, so i mean here we are in the the tail end of of uh of march here filming this but it's one of those things where I still think we're a couple weeks out. I mean, the spawn really hasn't got started going yet, um, and certainly the bite hasn't either. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree with you. I think uh, that storm didn't help that we had last week. Yeah, we got, and the uh, one before that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. we, got, we got pounded twice. I, I went out to Cherry Creek. I was there, I think uh, it was the week after they opened, and some of the water temperatures in that lower, smaller basin was kind of in that 45 degrees. And you could see a lot of fish staging. It For seemed sure. like things were about to get fired off. And then, you know, a storm like that, it can drop the water temp a few degrees and yeah. that shuts them off. Yeah. And I mean, the pressure changes with some of these big ones. I mean, that first storm we had obviously was was for a prolonged period of time. And and uh, I mean, that pressure was, was significant. And then this last storm, we didn't get hit with quite as much. But I mean, the pressure still were, were it was a big storm. So yeah. everything was uh, getting affected. And yep. maybe we'll level out. Some more weather's on the way. But uh, you can't complain about that around here. No, you can't. So. You can't for sure. Yeah. I think uh, we all get excited about getting the boat out, right, and throwing it on the water. But uh, here, it just seems like every year, it's the same month where yep. the fish really get started, and it doesn't really matter too much outside of yep. that. It's almost like a date thing than it is an actual weather thing. It is, and I mean, the thing we're dealing with right now as well is is the bait. Um, you know, at Chatfield last year, we didn't have any have any shad because the year prior, the lake had That's dropped right. down. The, the shad were not successful in their spawn, but this last year, we had a very successful spawn. And when we've been out fishing, uh, we've been seeing a lot of bait flittering on the surface and actually hooking a little bit of it as well but there's a bunch of them that are like three to four inches long and last year the yep. walleyes were skinny and honestly probably starving in the early part of the season but right. now that's not the case right so. yeah absolutely i've seen a couple couple of the fish that have come out of the local waters that have been posted are fat fat they're yeah. healthy, the healthy Chatfield, cherry creek pueblo all of the above and that's the nature of a gizzard shad fishery and and when we're dealing with some of those north country fisheries up in minnesota and wisconsin it's not as cyclical of a bait fish habit like we have out here so yeah. that uh they get that early season bite a little bit better than we do but these flakes are are real healthy it's just a matter of fighting through the shad absolutely yeah i think a lot of people think about like 10 11 12 pound fish coming out of your mcconaughey's yep. or some of the south dac lakes and i mean shoot chatfield has just as much of an opportunity of a 10 pound fish than just about anywhere right now. They are there. I mean, they're not there maybe with the numbers that you'd be finding at McConaughey or some of those other lakes in the Midwest. But the la the fish are, are – are, there's big fish that are certainly there. And I think we're kind of getting to a point now where – a lot of anglers are recognizing the fact that those big fish need to get put back in those lakes as well. So that's something I always am, am preaching. Keep your eater size fish, but when you're starting to deal with those big females, it's going to just help the fishery overall. Whether it's a broodstock fishery like we have in Colorado or it's a fishery that doesn't have a lot of natural reproduction, I still truly feel like those big fish, um, you know, it's better for the, the fishery itself, better for the angler to have those big fish continue to stay in the lake. Absolutely. That's something I've always appreciated about you, Austin is the the conservation piece i think yep. you know even when i started coming in here I, I started coming in to discount i think 
religiously probably in 2007, 2008. Yep. And uh, it was when I first got my first boat and ended up uh, you know, hearing from you a lot about the fishery. And then you'd always end the conversation with, you know, there's those big girls, let them, let them go if you can. You I'm, know? A, I'm a big awesome. proponent of it. I mean, of all species, I mean, you know, I obviously make my whole living out of, out of all these lakes. And uh, the higher quality the fishery is, the, the better the, the, the fishing is overall. So, right. um, you know, but I'm fine with people keeping fish, fine with that. It's just those those big fish of all species i think those those ones uh it's a good thing to send those ones back that's right keep the genetics in the pool that's it <laughs> right on well um i appreciate the uh the conversation here and we'll get more into it i do want to uh, maybe you can remind me later in the podcast but i do want to talk about how chatfield is fishing so much yep. differently or the same whatever your opinions would be uh with this new water pool because sure. i think that's a lot of things or a lot of reason why maybe some of the anglers are struggling um and then also you know there's there's some reliable tactics I think you can go back to that we were fishing 10 years ago when the water was low yep and uh, you know it was still it's still working now with the the full pool so. it is and I'm happy to talk about that it's something I think is gonna be really cool this year we had high water last year the bait fish were different than they are this year but I mean I'm happy to dig into that because yeah think it'll be a be a pretty cool thing yeah this let's year. let's definitely talk about it I think that's that's important for the viewers um, Wanted to get started with a couple questions that I had here. Wanted to um, just really give viewers a, a base knowledge of who Austin Parr is. So uh, first thing that I've got here is I always want to know from somebody, how did you get into fishing? Yeah. Because that's always like, that's the catalyst, right? We're yes. all addicted. We're here. We're sitting in a tackle shop. We're talking about fishing. How did we get started? What What got you hooked? Well, I mean, I, I can single-handedly put that on my dad's shoulders for sure. I okay. mean, it's one of these things where, you know, there's a lot of people that want to get into it, but my dad really went out of his way to, to make sure that I was out on the water and in the field and, and uh, gave me a, a really big start uh, for that. So, I mean, as far as the, the passion was from the start, I mean, I, I can't really say it was a, a specific thing sure but it was just the generality of going out all the time and and going out with someone that that generally knew what he was doing and obviously we've learned a lot since back then too but yeah but finding the success early on i think was really the the thing that that got me hooked into it from the start that's awesome yeah you hear time and time again like you know that's the learning process that gets you hooked yep um you know i think like even we, we talked with nate and nate said like we had no idea what we were doing we weren't good fishermen yep. we just enjoyed it yep. you know and then we got out there and we started to learn and we're like oh now like we're For addicted sure. and that's we know how to do it that's something too where you know at the store down here i i really am am passionate about it because back when when i was was young there was another shop that was south of us called uh um all pro fish and sport with bob hicks i remember that yeah and i still talk to bob quite a bit but i mean bob Bob was, he really sat down with us. He knew it. I mean, he was guiding. He was in kind of the same position I am right now um, and, and a tournament walleye fisherman and, and a big time bird hunter as well. But he really sat down with my dad um, and myself and, and really took the time to, to get us squared away and get us dialed in with a lot of these different techniques. That's and that's sweet. something where I really try and remember that because when young kids come in down here, it can be the difference in their life, really. 100%. So, yep. 100%. Yeah, I actually... This is a, a little bit of a segue, but I watched a movie the other day on Netflix called Mending the Line. Yeah. And it's about, you know, military veterans learning how to fish yep. and like changing their perspective on, you know, slowing things down a little bit and appreciating nature and For getting sure. outside and kind of same thing. Like this old guy, retired Marine is teaching a younger Marine who's seen combat like, yep. hey, you know, this is how you do it. And, and he has him around a shop, actually. He has him clean up the shop and he has him start tying flies. And he's like, what's the deal, man? Why are you making me do all this? Yeah. You know, we got to we gotta go to the river and fish. Thought you are teaching me how to fish. He's like, you just learned the first rule in fly fishing, which is humility. <laughs> yes. It's like, oh, yes. yeah, it's nice to learn from those old timers. They For really sure. know what they're, they're doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that's the, the benefit, really, of the small shop. And I'm biased to that, being the small shop guy. But... You know the being able to go in and and talk to those guys that that really know and and get you that uh that first start i think is a big deal absolutely absolutely well right on that's awesome yeah i'm glad glad that you're in the fishing world with us so <laughs> For sure kind of going completely other spectrum um so you get into fishing and i think guys take it one of two ways it's a leisure or it's just a total lifestyle yep. and when it becomes a lifestyle it's like 
you know, you either are ingrained like you are, um, or maybe you take it the tournament route. Yep. Um, so from a tournament perspective, um, do you fish them? Do you I, like tournaments? Like what's your, what's your perspective on tournaments? Well, as far as tournaments, I, I don't mind them one bit. I like them cause I sell a lot of tackle with tournaments, <laughs> yeah. but as a guide and for all these years, I feel like tournaments are kind of a negative okay. for me. Sure. Um, just for the fact of, you know, if, if I win, I'm supposed to. And if I don't, I kind of suck. Yep. And, you know, because everyone has their day out there. I, mean, oh, I don't care who sure. you are. I mean, like, when you're dealing with tournaments, you're dealing with, like, some of the best guys, whether it's a local type of a deal or obviously a national deal just coming off the Bassmaster Classic. But, I mean, you know, a prime example of that is looking at Ben Milliken this last week. I mean, he's a guy that's been placing really, really high, doing really good, but he just did not figure out the lake on the that's Classic right. this last time. And, I mean – Every day is different, but for me, I just like I said, I don't I don't fish them a whole lot. Guiding takes up a lot of my time. I've got some young kids at home that we'll I'm sure discuss, but uh, sure. the uh, the the time away is significant with tournament fishing and and around here, even on the level of like the Wyoming Walleye Stampede, which provides some pretty good payouts. The money is not not there. It's, right, it's a uh, it's a lifestyle thing really exactly. around here. Yeah, it seems like unless you're re- you're really getting into it, it's more you're gonna fish a tournament for fun once in a while, yeah. But not you know make a lifestyle out of it unless you're willing to travel. And, and I know guys that do it. I mean, like yeah. some of my best friends fish those stampede tournaments like you wouldn't believe that are are good anglers and doing it. But uh, yep. you know, for me, it's it's with the guiding and the store, it just doesn't doesn't make as much sense. A little tough. Yeah, yep. no, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah, I I would tell you, you know, for me. I like fishing tournaments for fun, yep. Um, but I put too much pressure on myself, <laughs> sure. and I just it ends up being something that I hate because yep. I'm like I just paid money to like drive myself mentally crazy, um, where I could just go out and fun fish and there's, like forget about it. And there's usually a better to that, yeah. And yeah. I mean, I totally feel the same way with guiding as well, where you know the the pressure is there, and and you know it's it's not like you're just out there with your buddies. So exactly, it's, it's it's a whole different mentality when you really get into it. It is, it is for sure. Well, right on, yeah. So I wanted to talk about this place that we're in right we have this big mega bass wall behind us some yep. of the some of the lures that are going off the shelf in the recent years um let's talk about discount how did you get involved with the store when did you start like just give us a little background and, and where we're at today yeah so i mean this uh the shop's been here since 1991 okay and originally came f- as really kind of an army navy surplus style of store Hence oh really the name discount fishing tackle okay. it was it was seconds it was um you know it just started with the original owner who's still down here mike gray he uh bought thirty thousand broken fishing rods from berkeley and that was before <laughs> berkeley was pure fishing it was berkeley berkeley yeah and wound up fixing the rods and reselling them and then kind of turned into this snowball effect of figuring out these seconds from all these reps but then Nowadays, we've evolved it into a fishing store that goes from the cheapest to the highest end all the way through. And so Mike was around the shop. Uh, or I mean, he, he, I, I grew up right around Mike. I mean, I've yep. been coming in here since I was a little guy, but we actually were in the same neighborhood, the original owner. And I started working down here in, in uh, high school when I was 15 Okay, and uh, have consistently, uh, you know, like I said, been down here ever since I'm 30 now. And um you know, so I've, I'm buying into the store at yeah. this point. So, and, well, that's great. and every year we're, we're adding new stuff and, and, uh, you know, Mike is, is the, the most brilliant businessman I've, I've mm-hmm. ever known. And I think that's something that he's really taught me as well, where, you know, there's a lot of these shops where I think guys open them as, you know, a project as, as a hobby thing, but in order for something to be successful, you have to almost eliminate your hobby out of it, which is somewhat challenging when it's a lifestyle for me. Right. You have to look at it from the the business element and and he's really taught me how to do that. So that's a a big deal there for sure. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've been able to outlast the, the big box stores coming in. I mean, there's so many small tackle shops, you know, all proficient sport included that I just, mentioned that have all folded based upon various measures and uh i think that's something that you know we're continuing to stay strong with customer service is always you know what i'm what i'm looking at and that's that's always number one customer service and selection absolutely and i think there's a lot to be said right about the knowledge that you provide um and that's something in the fishing industry we'll just never get away from is you know industry secrets what people want to say and they don't want to say 
the one thing I'll say about this shop is you can come down here and tell them any body of water that you want to go fish and they have knowledge on it. Um, they're willing to give that knowledge. They're willing to share, you know, what lures are working. Um, and they just give it flat out. And I think that's what keeps you in business over some of these other companies is yeah. because, you know, it's very transactional. They come in, well, you could maybe use this. You maybe they're being very vague, right? Where you are specific, like, Hey, you want to get up on the brakes and you want to fish yep. this like this. And this yep. is why I would choose this ounce versus this one. I mean, it's just so detailed and that's what fishermen are looking for. We're all looking to learn. Yep. And I truly feel like even even if you give a good fisherman all the information, they still got to go out and execute. For sure, right? Absolutely. So that's where that's where I feel like you know you give them the knowledge and you're you're teaching them to fish, but they got to go and learn it themselves. Yeah. You know, and that's yeah. that's empowering for sure. Well, and we try and continue to do that. And, and running a shop in Denver is challenging because we have so many different types of fishing around here. I mean, we right. have to carry everything from you know jerk baits behind us here to all the fly fishing stuff, tr trout conventional gear, live bait, lake trout stuff. The list goes on and on. Yep. And uh, you know like you mentioned we don't always have the the exact information for a given body of water but we've got an idea you right. know we've been there we've done it before maybe we weren't there this year but we've been there last year and same type of of deal there so i yeah. think that's a, a you know a big factor in in being able to provide the best customer service possible absolutely no i think that's great and i wanted to talk about you kind of were just getting into it a little bit but like Let's talk about just the selection here because yeah. I think people don't understand exactly what all you have. Like yeah. there is, I'm looking at at least 150 rods right in front of me. Yeah. And you know, that we can just barely see past those and the rest of your shop is all behind. Yeah. Um, what sort of things do people typically come in looking for? What do you sell a lot of? Like what can people find here at discount? You know, and that, that comment is so funny because it's, every single customer is is different you know there there'll be a guy that'll come in looking for bait we've got live bait we've got all the power bait options basic level stuff right then you may have a fly fisherman that come in um i have one of the best if not the best fly tying selections as well as fly selections in the state from, i agree from bottom to top i mean that's I'm talking, not conjecture <laughs> yeah that's, there's a lot of stuff that's talking about over there and obviously you can't have everything but that's that's there but then yep. as far as on the the true conventional side i carry rods from bottom all the way up to top i am loomis and st croix down here up to the highest end mega bass stuff behind us that's really been amazing over the last year or so absolutely um, guys love that stuff it's it's super high quality but you know trying to just provide the the well-rounded tackle if you're a walleye angler bass angler fly angler trout conventional angler i'm going to likely have what you're looking for and and i mean obviously there's an unlimited number of things in this industry but uh, yep. as you mentioned the rods it's you'll be hard pressed to find a rod that's not going to work for you in here right so. and it's and it's even like the random stuff too like you guys will carry sleds right like jet yep. sleds yeah um you have ice fishing stuff oh yeah the ice um, is big so yeah different seasons i mean you guys carry the gamut of stuff but even like you know when it comes to some of those larger swim baits and stuff oh, yeah. that you don't usually see like musky baits and stuff like yeah. you've got some of those here too we have a lot of those and i mean that's been uh, kind of an interesting one luke davidson who uh has worked down here for for years really kind of pushed me into that he's a, a talking about tournaments a tournament bass guy yeah and uh you know i i kind of was skeptical at those at first as you mentioned you know, sure. you're thinking about you know what is this but then next thing you know you have hundred dollar huddlestons going off the shelf seventy dollar um you know bull shads going off the shelf as well as lots of less expensive options but yep. uh, if you're looking for big baits i've got you covered as well yeah you know i, I got one guy on my boat uh he's he's been on in a couple of videos his name's Corey. he's uh one of my friends and every time we're out on the boat, he throws something just wacky. Yeah. And he's like, dude, I don't care. Like, I know you're <laughs> catching 10 fish with yeah. your little, you know, blade bait or whatever it is. He's like, I'm going to throw this pike swim bait yeah. and I'm going to catch something with it. And yeah. when I do, you're going to you know, wish you were throwing a pike <laughs> swim bait. And sure enough, he does. You yeah. know, he'll be out at Chatfield throwing a pike swim bait, catch a big old bass. I'm like, I didn't even know there was a large mouth in here yeah. that size. Well, and I think that's just talks about guys' different tastes and their 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 different styles. I mean, some people right. are looking for it for numbers and, you know, true, truly some of those baits are what you want to throw for big pike and muskie, but you'll have those same baits get thrown for large mouth as well. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of an interesting way to, to think about it. Um, so yeah, uh, if you are looking for anything, it's here at Discount Fishing Tackle. Come check them out before you go to the big box stores, support a local business. They've been here forever. Like you said, from 91, right? Yeah. So, 
I and mean, when, and when you're talking about it down here too, as far as price is concerned, I am right there with everybody. Every single time I'm setting a price, I am matching or or better than big box. And when you're dealing with big items, all those are set MSRP stuff. So I mean, it's truly a deal where it is. Unlike some small businesses where, you know, you may be paying a little bit more. I mean, I really do my best to try right. to not have that happen. Right. So. And keep in mind, too, I think a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to come buy all this stuff, go home and set it up. You guys do a lot of it here. We You'll can. spool up the rods. Yeah. You can show them how to tie knots, you know, yeah. whatever it may be. If you're a new fisherman, this is a place to come. You don't have to be intimidated. I think some of the bigger box stores, it feels a little bit more like, oh, we have all these options yeah. and you can come spend all this money with us. But there's not really the education piece sure. where you know you could provide that you spool up some line you guys have big spools back here you have yep. a bunch of reels i mean you guys do all the the full and, service and, and even when you're talking about spooling even if i didn't have access to a spooling machine if i could find someone that really knew what they were doing i would have the spooling machine do it it does such a higher quality job than just reeling it on okay and i think it makes a big difference hey, that's a good well. point but we pride ourselves in spooling down here i'm not <laughs> sure. putting something out that's not good for sure yeah no I, you've definitely spooled up a few things for me in the past as well so um anyway that's just kind of a blip it on discount fishing tackle wanted to give you guys a, a little bit of a high uh level idea of what's going on here at the store because it is really really cool spot I appreciate that yeah absolutely um, so yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, a few other things. Um, as far as you go, obviously, you know, you've got other favorites, right? We know, uh, Austin as the fisherman, but let's talk about maybe some of your off the water hobbies. What, what else you got going on in your life that you like to do? Man, bird hunting is one of my biggest passions of my life. And I say that, uh, loosely with the term bird hunting, cause I'll go from doves to sage grouse, to waterfowl, to true upland prairie grouse and pheasants. But I, I chase them all year long and, uh, I'm, uh, or all season long, but, uh, I'm passionate about that. It's a, a big deal in my life and, uh, I may not make a living on that, but right. that is my, Besides fishing, my big thing. That's awesome. Yeah, you got a uh, a couple hunting dogs. So original pup was Rio. Yep. And then now you have Sage. Yep. Right. Yep. And then you just actually ended up with another. Yep. Made the trip to Michigan to Southern Oak Kennels and right. uh, got one out of the same line that uh, my old older dog is. She's five now, but. Uh, Got an eight-week-old puppy at home, so, so dealing awesome. with the babies. <laughs> That's <laughs> yes. right. It's so fun because they're like puppies are the cutest thing ever. Oh, yeah. But it is so much work, man. It is. I mean, it. Uh, I joke around that a lot of these Labradors I get from these uh, these breeders out east, they kind of come pre-programmed on retrieving, and that was the case last night, making uh, a lot of retrieves. But nice. The crying and the the basic commands and all that kind of stuff you got to work through. Exactly. And if they have that innate sense, right, they're ready to hunt then usually they're a little more needy just everywhere, yeah, yeah. right? Like a little more whiny, a little bit more needy. Or if they're firecrackers when That's they're right. small. That's right. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. So, uh, you know, when we first met, uh, I don't think either one of us had done like just a ton of bird hunting. I think it's it's evolved a lot for both of us. You were hunting a lot of ducks, I was right? hunting waterfowl hard since I was little. I mean, I, yep. I grew up in a goose pit. Yep. And, uh, but have since similarly to fishing, taken it from a level of a dad introducing you to an obsessive level. That's right. That's yes. right. Yeah. So, um, you knew a lot of duck spots and you, you're actually a big fan of like walking rivers and stuff. Sometimes. Um, yeah. Can be really productive, which I don't do enough of. Yeah. Um, but either way, um, sort of evolved into like upland like i remember oh, yeah. we were talking about ducks and i would see you at we'd run into each other yeah we'd be out hunting and I, we'd run into each other I remember one time we ran into each other at a slough yeah and it was like hey is that you yeah it's me yeah. okay let's hunt together yeah. right um but either way it's kind of evolved into this like all sorts of birds you've been sure. talking to me about sage grouse yep. you've been talking to me about um you know prairie chickens uh, it doesn't matter pheasant yep. uh and then more recently even turkeys like for you sure. have gone full bird yeah and i mean that's where the uh, evolution has come for me is truly the upland level and i think that a lot of that has driven from the different breeding of labradors and getting into some that rather than being like an english show line that are kind of stumpier into true english field that can run all day just like a short hair and that makes a difference but yeah uh, but yeah i mean the upland I, i've hunted a lot out of blinds i'll sit there and do it but the thing i love so much about it is getting out and 
moving and yep. and chasing them. That's that's my my thing. Absolutely. And I think uh, with anybody, you know, that that does a lot of upland birds, like the number one is getting the birds. So that means you got to have dogs, yep. right, to a help you times. find it. Number two, though, for any bird hunter is your shotgunning skills. Oh yeah, that's so always always something. How uh, how much practice do you do, or are you just out there shooting at birds and you feel like you get better as you go throughout the season? I mean, I shoot sporting clays every every summer, but I mean, I think it kind of when you start really understanding the fundamentals of wing shooting, it's a lot like riding a bike where you know when you when you feel solid. I mean, you're you're hitting hitting good, right? And I mean. You know, if you're hunting a lot, I mean, it obviously is a lot like going to the sporting clay range, especially if yeah. you're getting into doves and stuff early and getting into a lot of early season duck opportunities. But, I mean, practice is always important to get to that level. But then once you get to that level, I think that, you know, yeah. you can just evolve into to better shotgunning skills and, and making sure somebody's got the, the proper equipment and the proper fit, I think, is always a really important thing Absolutely. on your shotgun as well. Yeah, they say it's like an extension of your body, it right? Is. As soon as you realize that your hands are going to do the work yep. and your eyes need to just be trained, yeah. then, then it's second nature. There's no aiming. I mean, with turkey, obviously, you're aiming, but it's not aiming. It's looking right. at the bird, and, and, and when you understand that, that's when I think it goes from that's the next level of right. success. Right. So two questions based on this, because these are just curious questions yeah. that I have. Um, number one, what is your choice shotgun for upland bird browning maxis okay it fits me amazingly well i mean i can't say enough about them i have two of them and awesome they're, they're my thing you got so, one and a backup <laughs> yeah i got a synthetic and a wood nice so. right on yeah no i'm i'm actually in the market for a new shotgun i've been looking at the uh, berettas for sure as well yeah um but you're but shooting e lefty right uh no i'm no, shooting, shooting right yeah okay. i'm shooting right but i've had a benelli forever yeah. and i i love it but now i'm like uh maybe i do want to go gas and try that yeah um so i'm thinking about turning the benelli into my turkey gun yep and then switching over to the uh you know, maybe gas gun. Yeah, I've been around some of those Berettas. My dad has one. He is a lefty, and it's one of the few options that are left-handed. Browning doesn't come like that. Oh, but, okay. Uh, I don't. Uh, the gas is a Maxis. That's the gas yep. gun. And yep. I mean, it's one of those things where I think that if you're a guy that doesn't clean your gun, then the or the uh, inertia is probably what you want. Yeah. But the gas is when it's clean. It. It's shooting good. It's the way to go. Yes. Yeah. I like cleaning the gun. I think that's I part too. of the game. It is. I <laughs> I enjoy it. I break them down on the bench and it's just like fishing tackle when you're getting your stuff ready and, that's and right. organizing it all. It's tying up your part, lures the night before. I love it. That's yep. right. That's right. I get that nice little oil going down the barrel. Yes. Nice. Right on. And then uh, my second question based on bird hunting is what do you feel like is the most common flushing shot? Right? Like I think a lot of times when I go, I, I'll just be honest, I go a lot of times to like a raised pen, you know, sure. shoot where they release the birds that morning. They're dumb as rocks yeah. and they're pretty easy to, to knock down. But um, I, that's what I've been mostly a part of. I haven't done yep. a ton of like outdoor in the field, really working dogs because I don't have a hunting dog. Yep. So what do you feel like is like that one shot that you got to have in the bag in order to, to get your limit? I mean, for a it's... Day? It's all somewhat variable when you're dealing with wild birds because the consistency really isn't there. But, I mean, right. if you're dealing with with generalities of wild upland birds, whether it be a grouse species or a pheasant, you know, a straight basic trap jump shot really is the, the, the shot. It may not be always the same direction. Sometimes it's a going away shot. Sometimes it's a quartering away shot. But I do think going back to it, the one to really try and master is more of that quartering away shot. A okay. straight away shot is put the put the beat above its nose and, and kill it. Yep. Um, you know, a, a shot that's a, a crossing shot is not as common, but that's more of a common lead. You kind of get the feel of it. But when you have those quartering away shots, especially with wild birds, especially old wild birds, they flush and fly hard. Yeah. I mean, they are getting out of there. And that, that quartering away shot is kind of funny leads, and you got to make sure to be – beyond that and then yeah. i think piggybacking off of that the shot that you need to really master is the first shot <laughs> if you're on that's a good point if you're on a pheasant if you're on to shot two and especially shot three your chances are going way down right so you have to make sure you are comfortable with the surprise 
lift and kill. Yeah, so. absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm happy to see all the photos you post of your dogs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, your dogs are super cute, but just, I mean, the success that you've had with Upland Bird is insane. I mean, you'll tell me like, oh man, I'm out. I got my limit of doves today. And then next week you're like, oh, pheasants open. And yeah. you know, I got my limit of pheasant. I'm like, man, you have really got it dialed. So it's, good for uh, you. it's like I said, it's, it's the passion that just isn't my living. That's right. <laughs> so, that's right. You got to have those though. Yeah, got to have those. Yeah. Right on. Um, well, yeah, so we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of a, your, your busy life, but uh, there's another element to that busy life that we're both going through right now and not something that we had 10 years ago, oh, which yeah. is a, a growing, budding family. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about home life and how that's, you know, maybe impacted your outdoor ability and, you know, how things have changed a little bit over the last five years. I'm real lucky. I mean, my wife is the best that I could ever ask for, and she's also into the outdoors. So cool. she's open to getting Labradors. My, my middle Labrador now, she's uh, say she's five. She's a day younger than my daughter. So okay. we had a first kid and an eight week old puppy at the exact Dang. same time. And for her to <laughs> not, like twins. for her to not divorce me on that was a, a good one. But yeah, she, uh, she's out in the field with me. She's fishing with me. She's hunting with me. And I think that that really is the openness of our thing. She's got her things that she can still go do herself. I have my things I go my, do myself, but we're also focused in and around the kids. But we're working on bringing the kids into the outdoors. Yeah. Had them hunting last year, take them sporting clay shooting, you know, get the big ear muffs on them. Yep. In the boat constantly, getting out on the shoreline constantly. It's just what we do. Yep. And I mean, we're. We're lucky in the the fact that we do that, and I mean, we'll certainly see how it develops with a, a soon to be five year old with sporting events and things like that. But for me, as a kid, it was uh, revolving around hunting and fishing, yeah. and uh, we'll see how it goes and see what they want to do. But having a significant other to do it, I think, really helps. That it, I haven't skipped a ton of beats. I mean, we've been yeah. been around, but we also make time to be a family too. Yeah, so. absolutely. No, I think you do a good job of balancing that. And I, I think too many people in this day and age, they pick their partner based on other things. Yeah. And then they realize as you get, you know, three, four or five years into it, it's like, shoot, I can't do the things I love because my yeah. significant other doesn't love that too. You and know? I think that that's the, you know, the root of a lot of issues with folks is that if you don't have somebody that you know, especially with this type of a thing, I mean, yeah. that's, I think the biggest thing that like, you know, when you're starting to date someone, figuring out like, okay, I like to go fishing and they think in their head, okay, I've been fishing before. Yeah, well, yeah. like this is different. <laughs> like hundred <laughs> percent. This is not normal. Yeah. And finding someone that is accepting of a not normal type of obsessive activity is good. I mean, I don't really yep. drink. I mean, I don't have any other real like crazy hobbies. It's like, this is what we're doing. Yeah. It's no other solid vices. <laughs> yes. Fair enough. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I couldn't agree more. Um, my wife is the same. Like, yeah. I think we did a lot more outside as a family before we had kids. Yeah. Now, granted, we had two pretty close together. Yeah, for sure. Um, but either way, I think, you know, as we progress our family, we will spend a lot more time outside yep. and she enjoys the same things yep. I do. Yep. And sometimes it's her bringing it up. Like, hey, yep. let's go and do this. I for really sure. want to kill a moose. You know, yeah. she's like, she's really into things that I'm like, really? Like, yeah. you want to do that? And she's like, yeah, like I'm into it. Let's go. <laughs> so, you know, it's that sort of thing that I think is really helpful long-term sure. relationship I think wise. it's a huge deal and I mean but I, I can't wait to to continue to have our kids grow up around the outdoors I mean it's it was a, such a passion in my life to go and do and I it's awesome to be able to do it myself now and it's being the dad yeah that's awesome so so fun to pass that on and yeah and see how it, it progresses in their life right I, I even thought about that with this YouTube channel it's like you know Maybe this isn't something that I continue on forever. Yeah. But my kid might be into it. Who knows? So if so, I'll just keep it going, right? Maybe yeah. he's interested and he wants yeah. to do it. Um, so either way, that's cool. I'm glad you're you're passing on the legacy and you got uh, a little girl and a little boy. Yep. So you got two. Yep, older daughter and younger boy, and he's about two and a half now. My daughter's about five, so they're getting to the stage where they're it's there. You know, the boy's not tripping over himself as much now. Exactly. So, yep. Uh, he's, about to start spinning the reels. He's doing it. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. Right yes. on. Um, well, transitioning a little bit back to like kind of your guide days, there's just some things that I wanted to uh, address. Yeah. So um, I think a lot of people know Austin Parr from Discount Tackle. Yep. And then a lot of people also know Austin Parr from Guiding Lakes, right? Yep. We'll see you out there. You are you are grinding the summers. For sure. Um, the one question that the whole audience is wondering, how does Austin Parr 
survive on the water in 95 degree weather in jeans, boots, and a long sleeve shirt. I mean, I think for me, it just goes, I mean, I have a really high heat tolerance, but I think it just goes for me that, that, you know, in my family, I got a lot of cancer history in my family. Okay. And if I'm able to eliminate or at least hopefully reduce a type of cancer, I'm big in on it. Sure. But yet also coming from attempting to do the shorts thing, obviously, you know, you have some breeze going on, but I truly believe that if you have the right top shirt to be able to shield you and shade you, it's not that much hotter than what you'd normally have with just the sun on your skin. But sure. I'm out so much. It's different. I mean, yeah. there's guys that go out on the weekend, take their shirt off, do whatever. But if I go get sunburned every single day, it's going to be a problem at some point in my life. I mean, I yep. look at guys like Skeet Reese that, uh, you know, is out all the time, just, just tanner and heck and then next thing you know he's got skin cancer going on and yep. then there's a, a gentleman that uh, i know that was a, a guide and a tournament angler and just a really nice guy he just lived up in minnesota but he recently died from uh skin cancer that was a recurring skin cancer on his face yep and it wound up uh getting into his lymph nodes and getting into his brain yep. and wound up dying purely based off of not covering up in yep. the sun and i mean it's crazy it seems crazy but i mean i'm going to attempt to not have that happen i mean yeah i think tan is bad yeah so. for sure well yeah and i mean none of us are really trying to show off our bodies really that much yeah <laughs> so i don't need to be tan for anybody but I'd it's not like be, i got a six-pack to show <laughs> rather be white and cancer free on the skin cancer department exactly later on. yeah we already have wives so nobody That's to impress it. around here That's it. um well right on yeah i just uh you know i think for most guys it's an important thing to point out especially here in colorado because you're just so close to the sun but you know i i'll go out on mcconaughey because i'm so excited i forget the sunscreen or yeah. whatever i get fried yeah. and the next three days i'm just miserable it's terrible. like forget the skin cancer down the right yeah. down the line like it's just miserable well and you talk about the sunscreen and sure you can put it on but like remembering to reapply it after the fight is good that's is true tough i mean that's like, true I mean, you get it on once, then you're sweating, and then, you know, you get it all, you get your hands all wet and everything, yep. and then, then you next thing you know, you're at the end of the day, and you're fried. That's right. That's <laughs> so. right. Do you think there's any truth to the sunscreen myths, like you get a little sunscreen on your uh, your blade bait, and that blade bait's toast for the day? I think you get into a lot of superstitions okay. in fishing. I'm not a big <laughs> scent guy, but I'm also not lathering sunscreen on yeah. the one thing that is my biggest pet peeve guiding and one of the reasons why i've switched to a lot of st croix rods that have hybridized non-cork handles is the slathering of sunscreen from folks and then gripping onto cork to oil and lube up my cork i hate that's that. right that's right and <laughs> so i mean i'll break out the spray sunscreen on the back of my hand sometimes but uh yeah i don't know i mean it, it's one of those things where i think if you could maybe eliminate a a, a, a uh, an issue that you may have i mean that, that variable gets pulled out maybe it's better but yeah, i mean i can't element. definitively say that like that's making it so you're not catching a fish fair enough fair so. enough yeah coming from a guy that probably doesn't use a ton of it because you cover up i figured i'd ask yeah um okay cool right on um wanted to ask you just about your guide service yeah. so what what do people need to know about Austin's guide service? What kind of services do you provide? What fish do you catch? What lakes? Like, just yeah. give us a general rundown. So as far as the guide service, you know, my whole living and my whole life is based around the store at Discount okay. Fishing Tackle here. The guide service is is a secondary deal. Okay. And, you know, I, I book it separately. But, yeah, you know, I have my own outfitter's license. It's my own deal separate from the store. Yep. Um, but I guide on Chatfield and Cherry Creek Reservoirs. Okay. And we focus in on, on walleyes and smallmouth bass and and panfish out there and trout at certain times of the year but because of the store i go guide in the morning and then i come in here and work in the afternoon and doing that in any type of long range location is certainly challenging you know if i yep. was a guide service that was purely based on guiding for my entire you know my whole living i would have to be going to other places right but the chatfield and cherry creek trips keep me busy all throughout the boating season oh, yeah. and and for people that may not know i mean you might think i hear it all the time like oh you're fishing chatfield and you're fishing cherry creek well in reality those two fisheries are some of the best managed fisheries we have right in the entire region outside of glendale really right and the the, the number of walleyes per acre particularly in cherry creek is absurd yes and when that bite is right it's outrageous yeah so, lights I mean, out yeah it's one after another 100 fish days yep so uh you know i don't know if you guys heard uh he comes in in the afternoons so yes if uh you're looking to get the hot bite 
you come into discount in the afternoon. Do it. Or on Saturdays. <laughs> I don't guide on the weekends. It's yeah. uh, I got to sell tackle, but also it's a little crazy out there on the weekends. Yeah, so. for sure. No, I, I think, uh, you know, you're spot on. Cherry Creek and Chatfield, once those bites get going, I think it's really hard to go out there between May and July and not have just a blast. Yeah. Like you can crush fish those three months. Yeah, and the shoulder seasons are more challenging. We're in one of them right now. Yep. But when it's right, the shoulder seasons can be really good too. But I yeah. think that that really, as far as a guide, not doing it every day, I feel like allows me to get my customers and my into a better trip because I'll be straight up with them. I mean, there's some guides out there that I know when it's, when it's your mortgage, yeah. it's due, yeah. you're forcing it. And right. when I have this to, to do as well, this is my main thing. I yep. can, and I am, I'm, I'm directly straight with my customers where it's like, okay, this is the bite that's going on right now. Yep. And I have plenty of trips. I book up all summer long. Yep. I mean, it's your busy ridiculous. Season. But I still will gauge and move my customers into the bite that they want. Like That's coming right. up here when this lead core bite goes, I tell people all the time, like, if you want to jig fish, this is not the time. Some right. guys want to go learn lead core and they just want to catch fish. And great, we're going to go pound them here in another month. Yep. But we're not going to catch them casting. No. So, and, no. and uh, the same thing goes in the summer. I mean, there's some guys that want to troll and they want to learn it. May and June are not the greatest times to do that. Yeah. So yeah, it makes it a little bit more difficult when you're outside of those windows. And yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. I mean, and there's some guys that are going to have to, they, they have a date and that's the only day they For can sure. go. And you know, like that is what it is. Yes. But like having that knowledge and being able to hear that, it reminds me of a boat trip I took in Maui um, where the guys are like, oh yeah, you know, let's go, we'll go out. It's a good time to catch fish. Yeah. And when we got back to the boat dock, all the other boats were empty handed and I just, you know, sort of nonchalantly asked this other boat and he was like, yeah, it's just like, it's not peak season right now. Yeah. And I just felt so cheated. Right. Because I spent all that money yep. thinking that this is a great time yep. and it wasn't, you but know, you were only there for that week. So that was the week you could go. Exactly. But yet, you know, there may be other things that you could potentially do as well. And right. that's what I always, if I'm doing a guide trip in the saltwater, I'll talk to him about it where it's like, okay, you know, maybe the tarpon aren't going right now, but is something else going that yep. like, I, I'm from Colorado. I don't really care. Like, let's yeah, go catch them. And exactly. I'll do the same thing with my customers. Like, okay, say, you know, the, the walleyes aren't going, let's go catch smallies. Yep. Let's go catch perch. Let's go do a trout trip. Let's catch walleyes in this way. But I think, you know, that that's something that's been big with me is in the store and guiding, but just an honesty and, and really telling the, the customer what to expect. And obviously it's still fishing, but I right. mean, when you've done it for as long as I have, you get to feel, you know, that, okay, this is going to be like this probably. Right. So. Right. No, that makes sense. Well, I know rolling up here, and this is kind of a good segue, like we're, we're running into spring, yep. right? And everybody is watching podcasts, getting on the internet, learning like, hey, how do I catch walleye this year? Maybe yep. they're a new fisherman. They're just now getting into walleye fishing this year. What are some of the tactics in spring that work? Um, and let's talk about that from a uh, boat perspective quickly yep. and then also from shore. So let's kind of discuss generally what these walleyes do as yep. far as in the spring. So in general at ice out, depending upon where ice out is, it was earlier this year, the, the spawn is going to occur somewhere in and around ice out, usually 45 ish degrees, um, yep. is where it is now. It seems rough, like it's rough a, temperature roughly. So when that happens, these walleyes will move up on either rock faces or they will go into moving water areas. And I think the biggest misconception about walleyes in general is that the spawn is like the time to fish. Right. When you're thinking about rainbows, or you're thinking about browns, and especially coming from a fly fishing element, like yep. you can absolutely murder them during the spawn. During spawn. And I'm trying not to, to physically fish to spawning fish, but the other fish that are in the other holes are eating right. eggs and they're, they're Maybe they're just right before they're about to spawn or yes. just after. But when you're dealing with walleyes, when it's in and around the spawn, their metabolisms aren't going that much and they focus on that spawn. Right. So it is a time where the big fish become vulnerable, but it's not really a numbers time to right. go. So right. when I'm actively pursuing a slightly post or pre-spawn, spawn, slightly post-spawn type for time frame, it's pretty much jerk baits is going to okay. be the main thing and suspending jerk baits. Some of these behind us that we placed over here, these are Mega Bass Vision 110s. They're the premium of the premium jerk baits, but Absolutely. there's a lot of other ones. But uh, I'm working on a lot of times a slow type of a, a jerk, jerk pause type presentation if I'm on the shore casting on a 45 degree angle in relation to the bank. Same general thing goes um, when I'm in a boat if I'm casting. Now, 
when you're dealing with that, a lot of our metro front range lakes get closed for the walleye spawn. So for folks that aren't familiar, the state goes and, and they actually net these walleyes during the spawn. They artificially inseminate the eggs, and then they stock right. hundreds of millions of walleyes back into the state. Last year, it's like 117 million yeah, walleyes. Crazy, so crazy. they do them as a little baby fry. Yep. But Chatfield is not going to have the dam closed this year. Uh, they're just doing Cherry Creek and at Pueblo. So we'll have that opportunity from the shore there. And there's lots of other lakes that aren't dealing with that with closed dam faces. But in the boat or on the shore at Cherry Creek or Pueblo this year may be more challenging just due to the fact that a lot of the walleyes are in places where you can't catch them. Um, But Chatfield will give us an opportunity to do that. Uh, But if I'm in the boat, you do this a lot as well. But that nighttime planer board trolling type time frame this time of year is is a good way to go and yeah and uh what we what i've found at least is a lot of those walleyes are high in the water column during the the spawn and, and you'll find them in various places but those planer boards allow you to spread your lures out you can get more rods out you get lights on your boat you can get lighted planer boards you can do all kinds of different stuff to make that easier but uh, those boards and, and trolling sometimes really slow um yep. can be somewhat productive i mean there's some nights where you can really hammer them but unlike what we've talked about later on in the year the consistency is is very related to moon phase and temperature and pressure it's they're finicky sometimes early season yeah absolutely no i think those are all good points like there's there's plenty of opportunity in the spring and fall with walleyes yep. to catch them from shore. Oh, yeah. And, and even in the summer, you yeah. just got to adjust your lake. Right, exactly. Or just, you know, find that a little bit deeper water, find the structure, you know, and there's been plenty of times where I've gone out, you know, just fun fishing a different lake, right? Yeah. I don't know anything about it, and I just go and I start casting some curly tail grubs, yeah. and walleyes start picking them off in the weeds. Especially like, in the summer, mid, early to midsummer. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, I think that's all great points. I, I certainly enjoy the lead core bite. Um, yeah, and that's late, you know, later post spawn type deal. And we haven't really right. talked about that. But. Yep, and we haven't we haven't quite gotten there yet. So yeah. let's let's talk about that a little bit. So obviously you're talking about jerk baits for kind yes. of right around the spawn. Yes. Right. And that's mostly casting, right? Yeah, and I mean some planar board trolling certainly. I've yep. done good with that, but um, and strolling. Yeah, kind of that little kind of sweepy type of presentation when working the trolling motor, and, and you can have reasonable success with that at times. But right. as you mentioned, that lead core bite really is where the numbers begin. Right. So for the lead core bite, this is something that you actually showed me. Uh, we first got into this. We were actually making a, a video for it yeah. for uh, Cast King, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was something that they were doing a YouTube promotion, and there was a chance to like you know, win some money or whatnot. And so they sent you a free reel and we went out and we were just testing some things and we did yeah. some lead core trolling. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, what's what's all about that bite and why is it so effective? Yeah, so what happens during that post spawn is those walleyes will peel off of that rock and inlet type structure and they post up in the, the main basins of a lake. And some lakes are more conducive to this than others. So yep. uh, we mentioned Cherry Creek. There's a very large, consistent main basin. Chadfield has somewhat of a main basin, but due to the fact it was an old gravel quarry, there's a lot more ups and downs in Chatfield. But this same thing happens in a lot of these Eastern Plains lakes when the fishing is good out there. We've suffered from some drought over the last couple of years, so those aren't as good as they will be hopefully here soon. But when you're dealing with that consistent mud flat main basin somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 feet of water is where this really works. So these walleyes right. will go and they'll suspend, and then they'll a lot of times get flat down to the mm, bottom. Okay. But the key is to get your bait as close to the bottom as you can without actually hitting the bottom. Okay. So if you're dredging the bottom with lead, probably not going to get them done. Not going to get it done. Uh, suspended fish, not very active. Those tightest to the bottom fish are where you're going to go. And, but okay. they're not overly productive. Like you're not casting to them that much. The whole key is covering a lot of water. Right. So we're letting that lead core out until our bait just barely starts ticking. And then we're reeling it up. And the whole situation is to, to let it out, let it tick bring it back and I'm constantly adjusting. Right. So, and then as far as baits are concerned, a little small shad style cranks are always really good. Salma Hornet is my all time favorite for it, but shad wraps, flicker shads, both work good too. Yep. And then also we've been doing a lot of soft plastics over the last couple of years. So yep. a quarter ish ounce jig head with a three ish or three ish inch swim bait is really where I'll go. Uh, Kitex wing impact, walleye assassin, ripple shad from Berkeley, all are three soft solid choices, yep. but sometimes they'll go more paddle tail. Sometimes they'll go more crank and depending upon the day, you'll kind of have to play with that. So a lot of times I'll start off with maybe two different paddle tails and two different cranks until you really get something dialed in where you'll put four of the same thing on and 
really get to those good numbers. Right. But the key to success with that lead core, as I mentioned, is constant adjustment. If you aren't six inches from the bottom, you're not going to be getting them. And if you're dredging the bottom, you're also probably not going to be getting them. That's right. Yeah, I think that's where most people fail with the lead core bite is yep. they're just not adjusting enough. Yes. They When you troll, I think there's this concept of I'm just my lines are out. I'm yep. just going to sit, chill, drive around. Yep. You know, yeah, you'll pick off maybe one two fish, yeah. but you can literally change from a two fish day to a 50 fish day by monitoring those lines For every sure. minute or so. Yep. And making note of the speed, making note of if fish are eating on the turns, and this is all just general trolling things, right. but right, if, right. You're, if you're making a turn and you're getting bit on the outside, you're probably going to need to speed up a little bit and vice versa on the inside where your bait's slowing down, slowing down a little bit is, is going to be good, but make right. note, okay, say, you know, they're, they're not eating a jointed bait, but they are eating, you know, a little Hornet that's a four or number four Hornet. I mean, you have to make those adjustments if you really want to, to catch a lot of fish. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, another thing that's helped me a lot that I wanted to point out is, you know, when we talk about walleyes from ice out until just about the bait bite, yep. right? So we're talking like mid-May, yep. somewhere in there. Um, your your baits, as far as plastic baits, uh, whether they are soft plastics or we're talking about jerk baits or harder baits, um, you generally are going to want to use a slower kind of shifting bait yep. as you're in the earlier seasons yep. um, and then progressively move to those faster wobble rattle baits and, and or jointed or jointed yeah exactly I've seen, seen that same thing and i mean in in general that definitely is a pattern and that's where some of that lead core trolling with those those soft the soft plastics just the paddle tails can be really pretty right effective yeah because they start to get you know a lot more hungry so now they're a little bit quicker the water's warmer they have more yeah. energy so they're able to go after that faster moving stuff where yep. in 40 degree water those wallies don't want to move for much well and that's like the deal with those jerk baits right now is i'm having my best success on jerk baits with just a little baby rod tip flicks you know give it a little double pop yep. single pop and um, pauses yeah gotta I, pause i think people fish jerk baits way too hard and i mean in the summer i mean you can slash them oh, around yeah, yeah. i mean rip them around uh, and that's so much fun it is yeah. but that's probably not going to be the best move early. at the moment yes yeah no that makes sense um well great yeah no those those are all good tips for uh getting out for spring walleye and obviously like we mentioned we have this big uh, vision 110 section here yes. for mega bass uh i have caught so many fish on this particular style of lure yep. and uh it, it, they're just they're dynamite i think a lot of people have a hard time casting a 25 dollar bait they're expensive. but what you do have to realize about these guys is a lot of them so you, you have options floating suspending things like yep. that but a lot of them are not going to get down into those rocks yeah. unless you really force them to for sure so you can really keep them out of the snaggy stuff especially yeah. in the spring when there's no weeds well and depending upon the rock that you're fishing i may not be running a vision 110 if i'm on a shallow dam face yeah. i mean it just does not right. work. I mean, I'm going to put something that's a, a less expensive bait on it. Most certainly, we certainly we have those as well. Right. But when you're not getting hung up a lot, it's you're hard pressed to find a bait that's going to run better than run better than one those. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. Tons of selection back here too. Um, I was just telling Austin when I came into the store today. I said I'd really like something that's got a nice orange belly. I always have yeah. a lot of luck with those I orange bellies. I like, I like that. that. I mean, Come up and see that. Just a little bit extra brightness in mm -hmm. that full moon periods. I, I just think they work really well i agree um so kind of switching gears to just less about you know maybe the the walleye this spring but more about how how's chatfield gonna fish this year because yeah. i think a lot of people are not aware the water is up guys like it is at full pool it seems yeah new full pool yeah i mean it could maybe be at a foot i guess but i mean this thing like the bridge there's water all the way underneath you could yep. probably go up the the river channel for a while oh yeah um the uh, sort of point that comes out of the South Marina, uh, it I mean, there's maybe a foot of rock that you can see. Yep. I mean, that water is up there. Yep. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how how are you approaching Chatfield this year versus years in the past, and yep. do you think a lot's going to change, or what do you what do you feel about Chatfield? It's definitely going to change. So uh, when the water was down before they have increased the capacity, the majority of the fish that you were catching in the summertime period, May, June, and July, were on offshore structure points. And what I mean by that is there's an old roadbed and an old submerged bridge out there. Right. Um, there's lots of edges of the gravel pits. I mean, it's it's unlimited as far as structure, it feels like. Yeah. And, you know, those fish were in that 
between 10 and 18 ish foot range and you could pull bottom bouncers lindy rigs jigs i mean whatever you wanted out yeah, of the yeah. middle and you catch them really good yeah last year water came way up but we had issues with bait fish the year prior all the shad that were spawning up shallow as soon as they spawned the army corps dropped the lake like four feet and it dried up all their eggs so we had very few bait fish yep so we were catching the walleyes in shallower areas but not up into the trees yet in a lake like Jumbo or Glendo, when you have good bait and the water's up high in the trees, those walleyes go in there like bass. Yep. And that is what I'm thinking is going to be happening this year. We have a gotcha. lot of bait, um, and when the water's high and warm, the, those bait fish go shallow. They're trying to find places that they're not getting eaten in open water, and those walleyes are going to be right with them. So yep. I kept trying to force it last year. I kept trying to get into yeah. those trees and fish it. <laughs> it just never happened. I mean, I caught a lot of fish around the trees, but they were not in the trees. Right. And uh, it's going to be different this year, I think. I think we're going to be a lot of weedless swim baits, yep. slip bobbers around the trees, jig in a leech with a weedless jig head. Yep. It's going to be, if anyone's fished Glendo, it's going to be Glendo 10 years ago. It's what okay. I'm hoping it's going to be but uh so you know if you're a guy that's fished at some the whole key is just eliminating all of your memories yeah don't go off of any of that because yep. it is going to be fishing like bass and yep. i think it's going to be great for a shore guy or a guy that has a kayak or a float tube like if you can wade yep. out into those trees a little bit with some waders oh, fishing yeah. around that's going to be great float tubing and like i said kayaking i mean it's going to give that guy way more of an ability to fish even on busy days because you're yep. not out in the middle of the traffic exactly and yep. you don't have to fight boats or paddle mm -hmm. or any of that other stuff you can literally just cast line in a jig and make it happen exactly and i'm looking forward to it for sure i mean it's brushy and you it can be frustrating but you have to change your equipment you have to get a little bit heavier line heavier leader a lot of weedless jig heads that's all going to be the the yep. keys and a lot of my favorite things of open water structure fishing like blade baits and jigging wraps are going to be probably more of a cherry creek thing yep so. absolutely no i think uh what's interesting about uh chatfield is you know it's never really been this full no and it, it has a couple times just because of you know but for a limited nature, time but frame. it's very limited yep. yes and those times, it seems like it fishes a lot closer to like what a McConaughey would. Yes. And the, McConaughey, my favorite thing to do there in the past has been when it's at full pool, I'll go upwind, yep. I'll drop in a float tube, and I will float all the way back to a section where I can get a ride or yeah. go back up to my car. And it is such a blast because you're just picking trees apart yep. and you're catching catfish, you're yep. catching crappie, you're catching walleye. Yeah. And, and that's something to bring up like... I think with the tree situation, we're going to see a lot more panfish coming out of these these Chatfield, you know, summer days. I sure hope so. And I mean, you know, back to the conservation element, I think the biggest thing about some of these local lakes is that people need to kind of get back on the train of maybe not keeping an entire full limit of 20 perch or crappie. Right. And that should hopefully help this a little bit. But we caught a lot of big yellow perch last year. Yep. And uh, I mean, late fall, they were nice ones, 12, 13 plus inches. So awesome. And those perch, they, in order to spawn, they have to have their eggs be able to attach to something. Right. And being able to have all this brush and all this cover really should help those perch a lot and there's never been a crazy amount of crappie in really my lifetime right since the heron rookery kind of fell apart right um but there are some in that lake and i'm really hoping that's going to be something too but the perch are on their way already so yeah. the crappie are to be determined but right. the perch are going to probably especially in chatfield right like yes. cherry creek we see a little bit more crappie action yes white but, crappie yep yep but chatfield's i mean it's hit or miss if you ever catch a crappie in yeah there. i mean i'll fish all year long and maybe get two or three of them yeah and you know you go to cherry creek and you get them fairly frequently yeah especially with the lead core stuff yes. they'll, they'll eat that stuff yes too. and there's not like a crazy amount of them in that lake but there's enough that you're catching them whereas you know last fall we were probably 25 percent big perch on days where that's we awesome. were catching 50 60 fish total yeah and so that's a good sign for the perch at least very so good sign very that good sign. should be a fun one and you know we didn't have a lot of ice fishing pressure this year with the the poor ice conditions that's right. so it's going to give them a good boost. Yeah, it's going to it's going to be a fun summer. I think a lot of guys are going to get out there that that normally haven't because it's just going to change a lot. Yeah. And it's it's a fun I always like fishing the trees. I think a couple times a year I'll try to make it down to uh 
Pueblo. Yeah, oh yeah. And it's just because it's so much different than what we have here, yep. right? Like I can go troll all the way on that west end, and I've got the opportunity to troll through those trees and yep. catch crappie up high, and yep. then you know you got the the banks on the sides with the walleyes. I, mean, I have so much fun in that lake because it's just different, it something is. that you don't do here. And I'm looking forward to that too. I mean, you know, I'd never trade guiding for anything, but when you're doing it every single day on offshore structure, especially when it's really good, you know, having a bit of challenge, it might be pretty fun. This yeah, year. a little bit of a it. change. Yeah, yes. no, that's awesome. Right on. Yeah, well, thanks for explaining that. I think a lot oh, of guys yeah. will benefit from um, just kind of understanding where Chatfield's going to go. Yeah, and, and I think it's all to be determined, right? Yeah. There'll be new patterns that come up. For sure. And I mean, talking about these trees, we mentioned it before, in order for these walleyes to really get into the trees, it's going to require 60 plus degree water temp in the early morning. And so usually that coincides with May 20th ish. Yep. So yep. sometimes later, sometimes earlier, but you're looking for that water temperature to be about, six, 60. about 60, but in the morning. Okay. You'll have a whole period of time earlier in the season where that water temperature gets up to that point, but it's not enough to really penetrate down. It needs to be 6 a.m., 60 degrees. Got it. Got so. it. Okay. Yeah, right on. want to talk to you briefly. So talking about an angler, let's say maybe they're new to walleye fishing or maybe – they just are, are, they like walleye fishing a lot yeah. and they have that one rod that they leave in their truck all the time, rod, reel, line, lure. Yep. Like what is the one thing you could use pretty much, let's just call it like late open water, like kind of now-ish, mm-hmm. right? Like starting to get into April till just about when the boat ramps close. Like what's that one setup a walleye guy can count on to go out and catch fish? Yeah. So, I mean, as far as rod and reel are concerned, I've sold a lot of rods and reels over the last 14 years. And I think that the, before I get into specifics on the actual size, which I feel like is important, I think the specifics are also looking at purchasing the highest end rod that you can afford. Okay. The rod really is what is catching you the fish. A reel contributes to fishing pleasure. A really smooth reel is really nice, but when we're in fresh water, we're not having drag peeling runs most of the time. Right. So something that's a 100%. reasonable reel, you know, 60, 70, 80 bucks at kind of the cheaper end, that would be where I'd go. But as far as rod, if you can afford and get that higher end rod, it makes a difference. I mean, I swear to you, I totally. got, I guide with four to seven hundred dollar rods because i feel like it makes so much of a difference and so that's where i'm at but as far as rod size six foot eight inch medium extra fast action is my go-to for all things so when when rods are, are gauged you have your power and you have your action so it's a lot of times people will say a medium action well that's incorrect what they're referring to is the the medium is referencing it's kind of a mid-range amount of stiffness overall a medium light is softer a light is softer and vice versa going to the medium heavy and heavy but the action is describing where the rod is bending an extra fast action rod bends more toward the tip a fast action rod a little further back a moderate action rod a little further back and that extra fast action rod provides a soft tip with good rear end backbone that then still allows you to be extremely sensitive and that softer tip in that rod offers ranges from you know slightly under an eighth up to five eighths of an ounce roughly depending upon the the given rod so it covers the majority of your walleye and or other fish species applications now right pairing that up with a 2500 to a 3000 size reel you know of whatever grade that you want to go with i personally love shimano on the rod side i pretty much fish all st croix stuff yep and the line is also a really important thing and even if you can't afford a really high-end rod Buying high-end line is also a big deal. I think that's another mistake a lot of anglers make. They cheap out on line and they cheap out on hooks. Those are the two things that you can get a far greater performance on for not that many more dollars. It's quite a bit more percentage-wise, but the dollar-wise isn't that much. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Exactly. So going to a high-end braided line that does not stretch... The whole key is is having that that sensitivity. No so stretch. the no stretch transmits energy so much more efficiently than monofilament or fluorocarbon does. So you can feel every bite better, even on a cheap rod. It's going to pr- increase your performance. Right. But the downside to it is it does not disappear well under the water at all. Right. So some people will go straight to braid. I do not go straight to braid. Right. I will tie a fluorocarbon leader on, and yep. most of the time my average setup is a ten pound braided line going to an eight pound test fluorocarbon leader and the point of that is if you get snagged many times it's going to break and you're going to get a leader 
back. Right. So if you go 10 to 10, it'll break at your knot a lot of times, and especially 12 to 10. Yep. Um, but that type of a setup is is it. But the braided line casts further, it's more sensitive, and it has no memory, so it doesn't tangle. Yep. So it's better in every way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the only time that I'm really using like a full monofilament or fluorocarbon spool is ice fishing. Yeah, and I mean, that's one thing. Braid does ice up more. Yep. And even if you're really early season jerkbait fishing, I may spool up a thing of fluoro. Right. If you're going to do that, though, you better buy some high-end fluorocarbon. Because yeah. Because cheap fluorocarbon just erupts off a spool yeah. and into a bird's nest. So oh, absolutely. That yeah. is the, the key there. And changing your line frequently, if you're still going to be a fluorocarbon or a monofilament angler, that yep. stuff retains way too much memory. Whereas braided line, you can essentially fish until it becomes frayed and is no good anymore. Got it. So. And then, you know, going down to just like – the the lure yeah. that you can maybe catch a fish you know the walleye most yep. of the year i mean for me i think it's maybe maybe a paddle tail i think i could be pretty successful on a paddle tail most times of the year but what's what's kind of like your go-to lure for walleye fishing all year quarter ounce johnson thin fish or blind bait it's a no question situation for me you can fish it from the shore granted it's not great in a rock like right if i'm fishing rock it's no not my thing right but if you're on a generally bottom a uh, generally clear bottom it yo-yos incredibly well a lift and a fall and a yep. repeated process you can straight crank it if i my life depended on it yep. it's probably going to be a johnson, johnson fisher blade fisher. Bait. and there's a variety of colors but if i'm picking one it's just the black silver and i, I mean, think it's the, the variability of that bait oh God, by yes. just how you retrieve yes or you you move your rod yes you know you can do so much with that one bait and multi-species like yep. i mean if you're out on the eastern plains even in kansas or nebraska it catches wiper largemouth and smallmouth white bass catfish walleyes i mean it is as multi if a fish eats a shad they're going to eat a blade bait right and i think it's such an overlooked bait i mean even when that leech bite is just on fire yeah. and guys are catching them on leeches i'll go right with them and yeah, catch yeah. them right with a blade exactly one so, to one right yes yeah no and i i like that uh as well and that's probably why like a paddle tail is one of my choices is because if you are fishing a floating crankbait or floating jerk bait you are only fishing one part of the water That's column. It. But if you got a Jonathan Thin Fisher, you could be on bottom, you could be halfway, yep. you can do it fast, you could do it slow. I mean, yep. there's just so many options to that yep. kind of And a same bait. thing with the paddle tail. And I think that just gets into one of those things where it's a confidence type yep. bait. I mean, because I'm so confident with the blade, yep. a lot of times I'm tying a blade on. Yep. And same thing goes with, with the paddle tail. And I mean, somewhat being unrelated, but I think that the biggest mistake that guys make when they're trying to to catch fish is you know they're not catching them and they're switching all kinds of lures well of course that's yeah. a good thing to do but yeah the time that you need to do it is when the fish are really biting yeah when you have a bite that's wide open yeah. just stop take your lure off and i know it's terribly hard yes but tying <laughs> yeah. that lure on that you've heard about that you've bought that you know it, maybe you don't have success on learning how those fish are going to react to it really makes a huge difference. And I think that's a, that's a big deal. If you're catching them on paddle tails and the bottom's generally clean, cut it off, tie in a blade or a jig and wrap, you know, or something else. Yep. But I think that's how you can really de get that confidence in a bait to, to continue to, to evolve as an angler. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's all great tips. Yeah. I really like that six, eight size as well. Um, yes. For, for a while there, TFO and I had, a, had a big, you know, sponsorship deal going on. I'm still sponsored by them at this moment. Um, and they only had like a six foot 10 rod Yep. and that was kind of my sweet spot. Sure. Like it wasn't that seven foot and it wasn't the six, six, yes. but they had that six ten, and that's the one I carried everywhere. Yeah. And any rod manufacturer, it seems to be a pattern where, I kind of describe it as even and odd sizes. So a 6.6 six and a 7 foot are an even size. Right. Most of the time, those are a straight fast action rod. And with Loomis and St. Croix, that is the case. Yep. Not sure about the TFO one. But when you go to those odd sizes, 6.8, six, 6.10, six, seven, one, that's where you get to the extra fast action. And I feel like those rods are, are better. But yeah. if you're talking about a truck rod, the majority of those are one piece. Yep. So there are two piece options, but you'll have more two piece options in the even sizes. Right. Yeah. Love a one piece rod. I do too. And <laughs> I mean, you know, I've, I've got the big boat and the big truck 
truck, but I also have a, a small extended cab Toyota Tacoma. That's oh, a small yeah. little short truck. Yeah. People don't think they can fit a one piece rod in it. If you go through that passenger side door, you can get one piece rods, even in the tiniest of, of environments. So yeah, that's if you right. can figure out that one piece, you yep. get a lot of times better performance. It reminds me of those guys that have the Subarus and they put the bungee cords between the oh shit handles. Yes. <laughs> and then they hang all their rods up there on yep. the, the roof. Yep. So anyway, yeah, that's, there's plenty of uh, ways to get creative. So whatever with you it, do, sure. don't put a high end rod in the truck bed. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Broken a few doing that. Yes. Yeah, yes. for sure. <laughs> that's awesome. Right on. Um, well, yeah. So I think an interesting question for any angler, and this is getting a little bit away from the, the walleye topic is, uh, there's always, I think that one fish that either you're really passionate about catching at some point in your life, haven't done yet, yeah. or it just eludes you. Yeah. Like it's something that you're like, dang, like I really, so for me, um, it is a walleye, but it's a 30 inch walleye. Sure. That's the fish that eludes me. I've yeah. been out there so many nights doing the right things yeah. in the right spot. And I will catch a 29 and three quarters. Yeah. That happened last year. Yep. I caught one in August, 29 and three quarters on a blade bait. And I thought for sure I'd hit the 30 mark. Nope. I still have not crossed the <laughs> damn 30 inch mark and it eludes me. Yeah. So what's that fish for you? Like either one you haven't caught or what's the one that eludes you? Well, I mean, I've done a lot of the freshwater stuff in Colorado, and I think the one that that only really eludes me due to the fact that I haven't really gone for them, but I'd love to get up and do that high elevation golden trout. Oh, thing. yeah. Those guys, uh, there's a number of lakes that Colorado has stocked those into, and I think that would be you know, uh, a really one to, to do, but one that had eluded me before, but have since really kind of figured out are, are the wipers. And if, oh, yeah. if nobody, uh, has, has targeted those that, uh, that's the, I love walleyes, but yeah. wipers are, are, uh, my new thing. That they are if, a hell of a fighting fish. If I'm going on a personal trip, there's a good chance it's going to be devoted to wipers. There's wipers involved. Yeah. They're, they're kicking the pants. And a lot of times you get walleyes to mix in with them too. Oh yeah, for lakes. sure. That's, so. that's one of my favorite parts about McConaughey. We will always have one rod on the boat that has something tied on yep. that if we see a boil, we are there, we're tossing into it. I mean, I've casted a bottom bouncer into a boil of wipers <laughs> and caught fish. Is there know? anything more fun than getting wipers to explode on top water in a boil? Zero shot. Yeah, it's the, Zero shot it's, there is. It's the best thing in fresh water, I swear, outside of something in the Amazon, but that's yeah. uh, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, no, absolute blast. Yeah, I think wipers are key. I may have to pick your brain on that just because I've caught wipers plenty of times before, and I... I generally, when I go down to uh, Pueblo, I'll yeah, target some of those, you sure. know, and, and see what I can come up with. But um, usually it's a mistake, right? Yeah. We're trolling for something else and, and they show they up. And that's the thing about um, wipers that's so tough is that, you know, walleyes and bass, very structure oriented fish in the right yep. times of the year. You, you find them locked in. Yep. Those wipers are extremely pelagic. They are on the move constantly. Yep. And you just have to be ready for them, like you mentioned. Yep. And I mean, sometimes they're challenging to target, but you have yep. to be ready for when that time comes where you can target them. Yep. Okay. It has to be observant, right? Yeah. Like well, we'll, especially for the boil. Yeah, we'll see like, you know, oh, there's some birds over there. What's happening? Mm -hmm. And we'll get close, and then we realize, oh, it's right behind us. We yes. cast into there, and three of us are on, you yes. know? And you just – two of you will break off inevitably, but yeah. one of you will land Got that it. fish, yep. you know? And they're kicking the pants. Oh, they're so, so fun. Yeah, that's a blast. Well, that's awesome. So when you talk about the golden trout, are you talking about like more of a – you know, high alpine lake, like June, July, when it first ices off kind of deal? Or when, when would you target that yeah, fish? Yeah, so now a lot of people think that, you know, a palomino is a golden. You know, yep. it's like the orange color. But a golden right. trout is a true California species that they put into extremely high alpine. And yep. the, the time frame is limited to get those. And that's always the challenge for me guiding in the summer is that my time in that June, July, August time frame, a lot of times the fishing is really good on the front range. Right. So it's more challenging to get up there. But you got to hike up, get way up into those high alpine sometimes above timberline style lakes yep. and uh you know fly fishing to those i mean we've done yep. some of that uh for cutthroats together before and absolutely that's really a kick in the pants and the the goldens are the same way if you can get a day where you get up there in the morning and it's pretty calm you can sight fish to them and yep. and uh they love eating top water little ants and hoppers up on top oh, but totally. uh i think that's one that i really would like to to get yeah a huge blast doing that and and the other thing to kind of keep in mind with that is that it's usually like only a half a day deal you know a yeah. lot of those uppers they they get storms 
and you better get the hell out of there yep. before that storm comes on. Got to get you. there early, start hiking a lot of times in the dark, yep. and uh, pay attention to the weather. But that's yep. another thing that, I mean, Colorado's so cool is that you can do so many different things. And, I yep. mean, I, I love walleye fishing. I love wiper fishing. We're talking about all this. But yep. fly fishing is another thing that I really, really like to do, and especially right. that high alpine is the best. You get away from crowds. Uh, you have very willing fish, gorgeous fish. That's right. I mean, it's, it's and a fun. lot of stealth involved too, there is. which I think falls into like that. You're a hunter, right? Yep. Like the stealthy part of hunting, especially turkeys yep. and the fish. I mean, up there, they can be pretty picky and oh, you yeah. got to You got to get down tight to the rocks. You got to be wearing something that's like similar color to the bank. Yep. And uh, if you just even make the wrong move at the wrong time, they'll see you and they spook it and it's done. A problem. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Yeah, I would I would love to go do that with you. Let's yeah. try to maybe maybe link up for that trip. That would be fun. For sure. Um, okay, right on. Well, yeah, um, I guess, you know, uh, another question I had for you is, like, is there any other, like, outdoor bucket items that you want to do, like maybe things that you haven't done yet? Like, outdoors comes with so many options, right? Yes. Like you said, Colorado has so many different things you can do. Yeah. Maybe there's an outdoor thing that you haven't done yet or is a bucket list item for you. Well, I mean, I have been so involved with upland and waterfowl hunting. Big game, I think, is on that list to a degree. And, sure. And uh, a lot of it, for me, ends up getting revolving around the dogs and I've spent money on them and, you know, you, you feel bad about not taking your dogs out because that's yeah. a lot of why I bird hunt is because of those dogs. So it yeah. takes some of that big game out. But then, sure. you know, also on a more uh, North American style basis, yeah. I think that Alaska's on that list. But oh, then yeah. more recently with as much of the turkeys as I've been getting into are, are some of the Mexican turkeys. So oh, yeah. the oscillated and uh, Gould's turkey. Gould's. We'll see exactly how that happens with, uh, you know, the safety of the border type situation, yeah. especially up for those Gould's right along the, the U.S.-Mexican border. Order, but um adding some of those to the list is uh is yeah. good i mean and, and turkey hunting is an obsession also and uh it just happens to to get going right before the walleyes really get going yeah so that's one that's pretty good yeah no i'm i'm happy for you getting into the turkey thing yes. when we uh first started talking about hunting uh i had mentioned to austin like I think I'm going to go after turkey. Like I'd done some duck hunting yeah. and I was like, I think I'm going to start doing some turkey hunting. And we had a mutual friend that kind of helped us get into it a little bit. And then, uh, next thing you know, uh, Austin's asking me questions about yeah. turkey and I'm like, Hey, I can actually help you with something. <laughs> like I can actually give you some advice on one thing or two. And, uh, dude, I mean, I, I gave you a few tips. I didn't give you much. Yeah. Uh, I told you, you know what I could, but like a lot of turkey hunting, as you know, you have to learn on your own. Like yes. you're out there and you just figure it out. Yeah. And, and it's a lot of suffering. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. It is. And I remember you calling me and you're like, dude, like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm just going to keep going. And you yeah. went one time out on your own in a pretty commonly hunting area yep. and it's not easy to go and find birds back there but i think with anything if you're more dedicated than the guy next to you and you're willing to go further for it for or sure. you're willing to you know go somewhere where somebody's not yep. you can be successful and you were yeah and i mean the, the getting further back in there is something with that but then the other thing i've learned with turkey hunting it's totally different than upland is when you're upland hunting it's there's a direct correlation for as the further you walk and the harder you go the more birds you're probably going to shoot right there's a lot more finesse involved on right. turkeys you can get way back in there but if you're not being <laughs> finesse that's right it uh can sometimes times backfire on you yeah they they say that if a turkey could smell you'd never kill I one agree. because they are i mean they will hear you they will see you well before you even think that they can yes and if they could smell it would be almost impossible i yes. feel like yeah yes absolutely well yeah i'm excited to get after the turkeys fortunately i'm going to miss the first part of this year but uh we're definitely going to do some turkey hunting i think you know you and i had talked about trying to go together yeah. i've been saving some points yep. um so i think you know that there's a couple units that people kind of revere for turkey hunting mm -hmm. i think those are all going to be in play for me coming up this next season nice and part of the reason that i was holding off is just because of the kids right yeah. like it's hard hard to get out and I want to dedicate time for sure I mean you have to go figure out the roost you have to scout it you have to do multiple days it uh, takes some effort it's exactly like it's a limited tag sure but I don't think it's it's like most uh, you know maybe limited elk or deer units where there's an abundance of animals and you can usually go out and find them where turkey is like you can know they're there, but if you aren't stealthy enough to figure out which way they like to go yep. and you can get in a position to shoot, it's going to be tough. Not to mention, you know, there's, you know, fairly substantial nationwide downswing, especially in the Midwest and South. And, and, you know, a lot of the predator species, the raccoons and the possums have kind of put a hurting on them when you're dealing with the, the nest rating predators. Yep. So that's, uh, 
becoming slightly more challenging than it was maybe a decade ago. Absolutely. There's a there's an Instagram I follow. I think it's Wild Turkey Doc. I'll oh, put yeah. it I'll put it down in the link below. But um, very interesting Instagram where they go through all of the things with yep. turkey and really give you perspective on like their ranges and what what their predators are and yep. why they're having those low nesting sure. rates and. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, fortunately enough, a lot of the places that I've hunted, I've seen a lot of poults late yep. season. Yep. So that feels good. Yep. Um, and sometimes we'll pass on turkeys because of that. Cause yep. we're like, you know, there's the f- next five toms that we're going to have over the next, you know, 15 years yep. or whatever. But, uh, either way, I think you've got a point there. It's like, yeah. you know, you gotta, you gotta keep that in mind too. It's Just like it, with anything hunting and fishing, you better put your time in and better do some scouting too. No to make, to make, make it successful. Absolutely. No, I agree with you for sure. Um, all right, cool. Well, right on. Um, I wanted to talk to you just about some other like fun things. Yeah. I think uh, one of our best stories uh, is how we both sort of contributed to losing a drone in Cherry Creek Reservoir. Man, we, uh, <laughs> we had it up flying, did uh, some great shots with some We had the best day. Trolling. Yeah. We was, had so many good shots. Yeah. I mean, the, we, we caught them on blade baits early. We caught them on planter boards late. We were having that drone hovering over planter boards where it was getting blasted by fish. Yep. And then we uh, decided to try and land it back on the bow That's of the right. boat. And uh, maybe we should have just, uh, <laughs> just, just, just let it happen. But I think uh, so. we, we had a, a situation where I was attempting to reach up to, to grab the, the drone. This and, is totally my fault, by the way. <laughs> and it uh, decided to, to freak out a little bit once the accelerometer or whatever yeah. was a little off kilter. And it took off out of my hand, spun around, cut me yeah, like crazy. Yeah, hit your fingers so bad. And then just flipped into the water and sank. And I still have that waypoint out there where we were trying me too. to do it. Me so. too. I got a buddy who is, uh, they have a wakeboard boat, but his uh, father is like a diver from yeah. time to time. And I've been asking him, like, do you want to go out there and see if we can get that memory card back? Just because the footage was so good. It was good. And memory cards, I swear to you, that memory card, if we get it out of there and scrape the algae off, it's it is good. fine. Like, it will have all the footage on there. Could care less about the drone. But, yeah, very expensive drone. We had it, like, set up perfectly. And we had it, like, locked onto the boat. And we would hook fish on the planer boards. And we'd be reeling them in. And we had net shots. And, yeah. man, we were making the best content. And then I was like, you know hey, I think we can just grab this thing. Like, I'll bring it down, and then you just grab it. One of us has to fly it. So clearly, yeah. like, that's my job because, you know, I got to bring it close and, like, get it in the area. And then I just told Austin, like, if you reach up and you grab the bottom of it below the, the blades, then you'll be able to – it'll just turn off, you know. And so he goes to grab it. Well, as soon as he goes to grab it, the thing, like, tries to accelerate really quickly. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, it was the combination of that and then just, like, maybe – it tilting into his finger and it hit him so bad and, just and i saw that thing flip over and hit the water and i didn't have time to grab the net and scoop <laughs> it we tried to drag for a little bit we tried to see it on the oh man it was miserable tried but to see it on side imaging never never yeah quite do it <laughs> exactly but the funny thing was is and i don't know if you saw this on my channel we talked about it um i had been fishing with michelle at the blue river yeah and we had seen something in the water that like just looked weird and I thought it was like a fanny pack or something from like a runner. Yeah. So I took my net and I scooped down in it and it ends up being a Mavic Pro drone, which yeah. is the exact same drone that we lost in Cherry Creek. Yeah. And what I did is I reviewed the footage of that. I tried to get in contact with a guy. It turns out that I did get his license plate, but it was a rental car from oh. Idaho and they couldn't give me any information on the guy. Yeah. I called the police station up there. I reported it. I yeah. called DJI, which is the company that owns the drone. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, there's a, there's a protection plan on it, but there's no email. Ugh. And I was like, great. So yeah. I sent it in, and I got a refurbished one, thinking yeah. this guy might eventually call me. He yeah, never did. Never, so yeah. that is now the drone that I'm using. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it, it has a way of working itself Man. out, right? So yeah. e- either way. But, yeah, that's, that's kind of a funny story. The other one that I remember uh, really uh, clearly is you and I both went to a local lake that not a ton of people know about. And uh, we ended up catching back to back. You caught a jumbo perch, like a giant. And you got a big old saw guy. And I got a big old saw guy at the same time. Yeah. And it was, I mean, like master anglers back to back. Both on jigging wraps, right? Both on jigging wraps. Yep. Yep. And it shows the uh, the versatility of those jigging wraps. We're on shore. Yep. And people don't think about casting that jigging wrap on shore. And, and uh, that's a pretty powerful tool. It is. It so, is. Yeah, that was a blast. Absolutely. And it's it's like... 
I didn't really think about the lakes outside of Chatfield yeah. and Cherry Creek. And there's so many like just little small pocket lakes there and are. neighborhoods and stuff that yes. are just fun to fish. Well, and talking about conservation on those two, I'll preach it a little bit more where Chatfield and Cherry Creek can handle selective harvest. A lot of these right. little lakes, especially lakes that have saw guys that are sterile, can't handle that as much. Right. So if you're doing that, enjoy the fishery do it but maybe just think about what you're harvesting exactly to contribute to the conservation of the 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 lake as well chadfield and cherry creek are managed for the ability to pull those fish back out again because they put more in but these little lakes i mean you and i've spent a lot of time on them there's some cool opportunities out there and uh you know but they're somewhat fragile well we've definitely seen some go bad yes Um, there's a couple lakes we used to fish a lot and they don't have much in them yeah i mean and that's that's a a sucky thing you know yeah and, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I eat a lot of game. I eat a lot of fish. Yep. Just you got to think about where you're keeping them. From where they're coming lakes. from. Yes. Yeah. No, 100%. Yes. Yeah, we've done, we've done some fun stuff. But, yeah, it's, it's in those situations, it's more about putting the fish back. For sure. More fly fishing approach. It is. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just you got to adjust to, depending upon where you're fishing. So talking about one more trip that we did, I, I think it's fun to just reminisce about yes. stories and stuff and, and go through things that we've done. But uh, there was one day where you reached out and you're like, hey, we're going to make a trip. And pretty much everything you do is a day trip. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. There's a couple times where you don't. Yeah. And a, when I mean day trip, I mean the day. Like yeah. <laughs> it'll be 3 a.m. We're out of here. Yep. And you are uh, 11, 12 getting home, like yep. long road trips. But oh, yeah. uh, the benefit of that is you get to fish places that most people don't. And I get to still spend the next day with kids. Exactly. <laughs> you make it home to the wife, yes. right? Like it still counts. So not a lot of people have that dedication. I think you do that a lot for bird hunting, oh, like yeah. going to Nebraska or Kansas, going to Kansas yes. and getting into them, right? Yes. And then, oh, I'm going to just drive back. So um, either way, we went down to John Martin and it was a staple day. Oh, like. Yeah beautiful sunrise i remember taking a photo of it as we were driving in like the sunrise was gorgeous we got to the lake a little after sunrise and uh we hopped on we were there all day you're trying out your new boat yeah um and i want to talk just briefly about your boat situation yeah um but yeah we we had your new boat and we were out there and we caught the crap out of walleye crappie i mean pretty much pretty much everything yeah and we trolled we casted i mean it was a staple day it's great um but yeah let's talk just briefly about like you know, maybe some other lake opportunities, right? Like John Martin yep. was the one we were at per, in particular, but you know, there's some in Kansas and things like that there where are. you can go and, and experience maybe different fish than we see here locally. Well, and John Martin, that trip was pretty cool too. Cause like you mentioned, it was multi-species toward the end of the day, we stuck just a trophy saw guy. I mean, a oh, big, big one on huge. a, uh, on a, a now discontinued Sabeel flat shad weedless lipless crank. Yes. Um, that thing's but, awesome. uh, that was, that was pretty cool. But, but that fishery in particular does really well because it has so many of those different different species. Central Kansas lakes are the same kind of way where, yep. you know, you might go on a trip and catch 12 different kinds of fish. So, so fun. that's super fun. Pueblo is somewhat to that degree. But then some of those other ones down uh, in that southeastern part of the state I think are a bit overlooked, uh, particularly Blue Lake, also known as Adobe Creek. Okay. Probably our best crappie fishery in the entire state. Oh, wow. Uh, but also a lot. They stock blue catfish, which is very strange for Colorado. Huh. Channel cats, uh, and then a lot of saw guys too. So that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. And then there's another one. If we can get and that's some more good rains. It's a truly 100% rain-fed lake. And I'm not talking runoff. I'm talking big storm rain-fed, but it's yep. called Two Buttes. Okay. And it's south of John Martin. It had been dry for seven or eight years, and we filled it up last year. Okay. Um, so if we can get that creek primed up again and keep some more water in there, that fishery is kind of how I would describe the warm water version of Antero, where the fish grow fast. Oh, yeah. And it's a largemouth fishery. They're going to put a bunch of largemouth in there. There will likely be some saw guys and some wipers and such, but I yep. fished it when it's been good, yep. and I think that's one to keep on your radar. Okay. Right on. Yeah, no, I know there's a lot of a lot of different honey holes around the place, but just some, like, you know, these are good lakes to just go and get some experience, try something new, yep. and usually, because they don't get fished that often, your chances of hooking up are, are very good. Yes. You know, they're just not pressured like the ones here. For sure. And I mean, here we are in 2024, if you're going to be thinking about some of these lakes, getting to the southeast is where you're likely going to want to be because those lakes have held water for a lot of years. Yep. The northeastern lakes, due to the ag demand two years ago, all pretty much went 
dried to a degree. Pruitt yep. is the only one that's worth anything really out there right now. Okay, yeah. So they're stocking the lakes back, but yep. give those another year, two years, and if kind we can, of build up. Yeah, we've got a good snowpack right now. Hopefully, we can get that classic El Nino spring rain. Yep. And when that happens, those lakes are going to continue to, to get, get back to good. Yep. So yeah, there's definitely some good ones up there for sure. Um, well, right on. Yeah, that's great. I think, uh, I think we got, you know, a pretty good episode in here. I wanted yeah. to, uh, talk to you really quick about your, uh, boat situation because yes. that's changed a little bit from you were riding your own personal boat and doing a lot of guiding out of there. What's, yeah. uh, what's your boat situation now? Yeah. So I'm, uh, on Lund and Crowley Marines pro staff. Okay. We, uh, we buy a boat every year. I, I, I buy it in the, in the springtime and then I sell it at the end of the year. Okay. So it's uh, a new boat every year. There's an opportunity for a buyer to buy a boat that, you know, around here, the lakes are pretty small. It's only like 50 hours on yeah. the motor. Well taken um, care of. Super well taken care of, <laughs> garage kept. But it gives me really the opportunity to to guide out of, uh, you know, an extremely nice rig. And I'm super blessed to be able to have that opportunity to, to buy that boat at that pro staff and at price and then sell it at the end of the year. That's so, awesome. But it's uh, something where if anyone's looking for, for a rig, uh, you know, I certainly sound biased being on the pro staff, but Crowley Marine gives the best customer service that you could possibly imagine. They're very similar to what we are down here. It's a small business. It's family owned and operated and it's customer first driven. So Absolutely. it's one of those things where a Ranger, Lund, Triton, um, on, on that type of a department they have down there. That's so, great. Yeah. I think that's very cool. I mean, obviously new boat, kind of sweet, yep. you know, to do every year, but just having that relationship with them, I think it is, is is probably the most important thing in this industry with anything. I think, you know, just building the relationships, uh, there's plenty of people that I reach out to for product sponsorships or, you know, reviews. And yep. those relationships actually last a lot longer than just that, right? They do. Friendships, you know, hey, come stay with us. We know each other now. Yep. So it's it's that kind of a feel. And, and there's nothing better than a mom and pop shop, right? It is. And I mean, Lund is, is owned by Brunswick Corporation now, but Lund really has ran that same exact kind of way. Yep. I mean, they're made in the U.S. It's a big deal. Um, you know, it's, it's not a conglomeration of different boat brands with that. It's Lund's deal with parent Mercury, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a pretty nice deal. And, and, and the, the thing about Lund is that it's the highest quality you could possibly imagine. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong. I know, I think Lund makes glass boats, right? They do make glass boats. But the boats ones you're running are not. Are the aluminum boats. Yep. And you know, I've had glass in yep. the past glass sits really good you've got you got a glass boat yep the maintenance level on aluminum is pretty nice yeah no waxing no gel coat cracking issues and then right. your trailer is a little bit different but a yep. lot of those glass boats have a glass fender they do and that's been an issue and and having yeah. a good solid shorelander trailer on there um to, to combine with just super high build quality the one yeah. aluminum is really my way and i've got the opportunity to adjust through different things but that's been what I've been selecting and, and yeah. they ride great. Yeah. We were a little skeptical. I think both of us, mm -hmm. when we uh, first got to John Martin, just to like, give it a go, right? Yeah. Like if there's some big waves out here, we don't know how this is going to run compared to our old Rangers. Yeah. Right. And a lot of that is because of the gas tank and our Rangers, which is the same, by the way, we have the same six twenties. Mm -hmm. Um, the, that gas tank is in the very front yep. and it's heavy it and it heavy. weighs that front of that boat down really well. But yep. then we started riding in the, the Lund and it got a little windy out there yeah. and we were impressed for sure. It runs yeah. amazing. And, uh, those Lunds are, are fantastic. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. That's definitely, definitely a, a sweet little rig you got there. Um, last question and then we can wrap it up here, Austin. Um, and I really, again, oh, appreciate yeah. all your time. Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's always interesting to know the, the fishing side and the hunting side and the outdoors side, but, uh, is there any other aspect to Austin where you've got maybe a passion or a hobby that's way outside of what we do? Like what, like, are you a nerd? Do you play chess? Like what is the thing that maybe you do on the outside that nobody knows? There's a couple that, that have developed uh, over the last couple <laughs> years. I mean, one that's been kind of a long-term thing has been kind of drawing and art. I don't talk about it a whole lot, but I really enjoy that. That's okay. something that's, that's really cool. But yeah, one sweet. thing that's developed with my kids that I had no idea would, would develop is, is, uh, is chickens and gardening. Oh, so there you go. Yeah. Uh, we've since got 
you know, a, a number of, of uh, chickens now. And that was something I thought might have been a nuisance, but it would be good for the kids. But I've yeah. since turned into really enjoying it. Uh, not sure if it's quite the, the, you know, coming from the bird side of things. Sure. Like having the different species and breeds and stuff. Super cool. So but do they lay eggs for you and stuff? All or? the time. Okay. Yeah, surplus constantly. Yeah, so it's farm those. in your backyard. Farm in my backyard. And then at the same time with the kids, trying to expose them to all the different things. We've, I've never had a garden growing up. And sure. we kind of threw it at it. And, and that's been something. I've really enjoyed too. So, yeah. I mean, you get fresh food, but also you get to kind of go do something in your own backyard that's different than what I would be normally doing. Yeah, no, so, that's really cool. What's yeah. uh, what's the one thing you grow that you like, or what, what kind of things are you popping up in the backyard? A, peppers? A or? lot. It's a big garden. A lot of peppers, all different spice levels. Okay. Corn does really good out here. Green beans do really, really well. Okay. Uh, you know, we've done done pumpkins and watermelons yeah. and all pumpkins, that kind of stuff. Yeah, watermelons would be cool. Yeah, so it's it's cool. I mean, we're going to adjust all different kinds of things. We keep keep putting it in, but uh, yeah. but that's something that I think that, that we all kind of enjoy and, yeah. and having young ones at home to go pick our own food and that's right. and uh, you know, talk about the eggs that came from right here and yep. and uh, you know, go clean a bird out in the garage. I mean, all of the above. I mean, Cycle obviously it's life. somewhat cliché, but I think it's been an important part of my life. And and yeah. uh, these kids just are getting fed game meat and not all the time. But, yeah, sure, but, sure. But getting fed game meat and and their own eggs and and their own own vegetables and yeah, it's kind of cool. Oh, it is really cool, man. I I definitely agree with you there. I think one of my biggest accomplishments as a dad, at least I feel like, is my kids since they were born have pretty much ate a substantial more amount of game meat then they have anything else. For sure. My kids are the same way. And it's like, yeah. you know, my, my kid is literally growing off of the elk meat that I went and, you know, shot and killed. And I've been fortunate enough to bag an elk the last three years. And, you know, it's fed our family amazingly. Yeah. And, you know, usually more than just our family, we'll yeah. pass it on to friends and stuff. But uh, some sense of accomplishment there when you're like, you know what? Like my kid is actually growing off of this game meat. Yeah. And it's like, it's becoming a lifestyle for our family. It is. And, and I think that's a big deal. And I mean, I don't know about your kids, but my kids almost eat wild game better than they eat other things. 100%. I mean, especially like with, with duck and grouse and pheasant, I mean, the tenderness is really there. And yep. I mean, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have thought it would have been like that, but yep. that's kind of how it's developed. As long as you know how to cook it, right? Oh, like, that's the key. You know, especially with people kill ball. duck by overcooking it. Oh, it's like, yeah. I like Steve Rinella's take on, on the duck thing. He said in one of his podcasts, he's like, if my wife is questioning if it's done enough, then I know it's just right. Yes, <laughs> yes. And uh, my wife is also my, my test of that. If my wife eats it, we know that we're... We're in business. You're dialed. You're but dialed. I've also adjusted my types of ducks I shoot. I try and avoid the divers. I don't shoot as many geese as I used to. Nice. But <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. ducks eat a little better. Yeah, we, we hold off on some of those shots yeah. where maybe in the past we, we would have taken Let them and rip. said, forget it. <laughs> yes. It's all about the photo at the end and, yes. and food on the table. But um, right on, Austin. I appreciate it. Uh, I wanted to give you some time at the end of the podcast here. Anything that uh, you want to talk to the viewers about, you want to let them know about the store or any promotions you got going on coming up or just anything anything in your life i want to give you some time back so the, uh you know to do you in good graces thanks yeah. for coming oh, on the podcast thank you. and i uh, certainly appreciate it it's been great yeah it's but been I awesome mean, you know we just certainly uh, appreciate all our customers coming down and and we're you know happy to help anybody at any given point i mean that's the biggest thing i'm looking at is is if somebody has any questions if anybody has has anything uh that, that they're looking to, to question at all i'm more than happy to do that but then also i'm on terry wickstrom outdoors every other week that's so right that's certainly something to tune into on 104.3 the fan um if you don't have a chance to stop in we do all sorts of of uh, updates on fishing around the state so that's another good one to to look at to find some additional information that's awesome that's perfect and then you guys have a facebook right for discount we do yeah discount fishing tackle denver yep and, okay and uh, i would love to to do that i know sometimes you throw promotions on there yep. and things that have just showed up into the office there's one recently of uh, your new pup <laughs> yes. on there and some uh, some different reels and stuff st yes. croix's got a reel yes yeah, I, that's I, a I saw that. it's, it's interesting kind of an interesting deal there they're going into that real market and yeah. uh, expanding so okay. that's kind of a, a unique deal and, and they've been good so far yeah very cool and then yeah again we have these mega bass lures behind us those have been really really uh flying off at a oh, discount man. lately yeah we decided to, to bring it up over here just because they've been really popular here in the store but uh, i did notice there's a couple new lures that come out every year right yes. like some stuff that you know we haven't tried yet before and maybe could be really successful i know a few years back those were like the the shadow wraps if yep. i'm not mistaken or yep. you know some of these new baits by uh rapala and so what what now is in the store that's like kind of new hot maybe you haven't yeah. tried or think's cool 
cool. This year has been super cool for all kinds of new product. Rappel has got a new Maverick jerk bait that has a magnetic weight system in it mm. that's pretty innovative. Uh, I really do like those a okay. lot right now. What's that? Got some, what's that weight system? Uh, I'm so, just not familiar. So when you have, there's multiple different weight systems, all these different jerk baits. There's another yeah. new one from Shimano that that does really well. So essentially, okay. it's a weight that, as you're casting, goes to the tail. Okay. And as you're retrieving, comes to the front okay. of the jerk bait. So a Vision 110 has two tungsten weights that rotate forward and they rotate back. Kind of in that channel. They do. Yep. So the Rapala one has. A magnet on the front part of it so it a very light magnet okay so it catches that weight and it won't let it fall back ah. some of the knockoff vision 110s the weight will hang in the tail and it suspends tail down ah. whereas you know you want to sp- suspend it flat, flat. To, to nose down yeah the shimano jerk baits the weight system has a spring loaded system on it so when you mm. cast it the weight goes to the back and then when you retrieve it, it comes back to the front. So now the advantage of this weight transfer system is that it's taking all of that weight, putting in the tail of jerk bait, and it doesn't spin as you're uh, casting it. So the casting distance is substantially longer on those higher end jerk baits. Very cool. But then it still comes back to true as you're retrieving. Okay. No, that's awesome. That's that sounds pretty sweet. I might Super have to cool. might have to grab a couple of those yeah. before I leave here. I've, I've definitely seen some stuff like that trending. I don't know. If, I don't think it was the actual Rapala one, but I think it's a different one that yeah. does something similar. Yeah. It's like you can kind of work it on the bottom if you let those weights hang in the back, and then you know it can float to the forward if you pop it. Yeah. But yeah. That's that's an interesting setup with the magnets. Yeah. Super cool. I mean, my favorite thin fisher's got a total facelift. There's like like 18 colors now. Oh, that's sweet. That's really cool. Um, got some new forward facing sonar baits. That's kind of the hottest thing right now. Yeah. Um, but forward-facing sonar from Berkeley, the finishers and the credges, both those are super cool. And then we're picking up sixth sense fishing. As oh, well. okay. So yeah. back back with the Ben Milliken thing. Yeah. Uh, we have a monster sixth sense order that's here, and uh, we'll be actually showcasing that here um, at a trade show coming up as well. Okay. So that's going to be at the Gaylord of the Rockies Mile High Hunt Fish Expo. Okay. And when is that? So that's going to be the the weekend after Easter. Okay. So gotcha. Yep. Yeah, I think Easter is what it's coming up next, here it's this next the, weekend the 31st yep yep okay cool right on well yeah um i appreciate all your time if oh, you guys yeah. ever need anything from discount tackle what's kind of your operating hours down here it's like yeah, seven we're 9 a.m until 7 p.m every okay. day but saturday and sunday a little earlier on saturday eight to seven and then nine to five on sundays okay got it and does that change at all when you're peak season or is that just kind of that's the set deal that's what it is okay yep. cool well, right on so you guys have got the hours there i'll leave all of austin's uh facebook's and all of his uh, websites down below so that you guys can check that stuff out and uh just come down here give them a try if you if you're normally like a bass pro cabela sportsman's whatever kind of person or you, you're an online shopper come in one time and just give them a chance because I guarantee you, after you walk out of this store, you're not only gonna have the right gear, but you're just gonna feel more confident in what you're doing because of the amount of information you provide. And that's not just Austin. They have tons of great people down here um, and they all are very knowledgeable. They share knowledge. A lot of the guys here fish just as much as you do constantly. Definitely. And uh, that knowledge is shared across the shop. So yeah, well, I appreciate that. And, and uh, like I said, we pride ourselves in selection and customer service. Absolutely, so. right on. Well, thanks again, Austin. Absolutely, and, Chris. Uh, we're gonna have some more podcasts coming out. We're gonna do this a lot or try to do this more. Austin, I'd love to do another one with you. Absolutely, get um, out of the water. Yeah, maybe as we're, we're learning more about Chatfield this yeah. summer, we can do another one, um, get some other guests on here. If you guys could just comment down below, uh, you know, what kind of uh, podcast episodes you'd like to see or what sort of topics uh, we can get back with Austin. We can get with some other fishermen as well around the area. I think the goal is really just to get more people on and and just talk fishing around the state. Um, could be Colorado, could just be Mountain West, but uh, we definitely want to increase the podcast frequency and we'll get out and do some fishing here soon. But uh, leave a comment down below. Make sure you subscribe to Catching Colorado if you had, haven't already and uh, come down and give Austin a fair shake here. He's a good guy and uh, we that. definitely appreciate the friendship we have. So, absolutely, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Take care, man. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks for watching the video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in more relatable content, you can check out these videos right here. Oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe down below so you can stay updated on our next adventures.